I think we can all agree that it is very difficult to understand the brain. Part of the reason is because the sheer number of uh, neurons we have to study. There's about 100 billion stars in our galaxy, but if you look at the human brain, that's about the same number of neurons. It's also about 100 billion, but what makes it even more difficult is that on average, each neuron is connected with about 10,000 other neurons. Even when you look at a much smaller brain, for example, that of a mouse, there's still about 100 million of neurons with uh, that forming about 100 billion connections. What makes it difficult to understand is not just the sheer amount of numbers. The thing is that all the mental activities that we really want to be able to understand, for example, perception, attention, or consciousness, is really an emergent property of not just a few neurons, but instead uh, those millions up to billions of neurons that form a neural network or neural circuit by forming connection with each other, which we call synapses. So it's not enough to only and try to understand you know, 100 neurons, even though you can already learn a lot about the universe by looking at the 100 stars that are formed at different stage. So condense all this into a scientific question that we can ask. The first set of questions we want to understand is how a single neuron operates. For example, a single neuron in the cortex may receive 10,000 inputs. We want to know what are those inputs, and we also want to know how this individual neuron integrates all the inputs it receives to generate an output signal. So in another way to ask the question is what is the input-output relationship for the individual neuron in the brain? After we understand that, we can then look at how multiple neurons, uh, actually you know, tens of thousands of neurons that are working together by forming a circuit, and what are the inputs those uh, circuits receive, and how individual neurons within this circuit um, ex ex um, encode sensory stimuli or exit, uh, execute a neural command, a motor command. So in order to do that, we really need to span a very large uh, scale, both in space and in time, as uh, Mark mentioned previously. So for imaging method, what we would like to have is that we like to have submicron spatial resolution, because that is the size of individual synapses. Those are the size of the connections between neurons. But we also want to be able to have millisecond scale time resolution, because this is how quickly the neural signal is happening in the brain. We want to be able to image all those processes at depth because the you know, brain is a three-dimensional, rather thick structure, which uh, in all the adult brains, uh, they are also scattering. So one of the techniques that has been around for many years, which is very powerful in this aspect, are the so-called two-photon fluorescence microscopy. So the, this, this microscopy relies on the excitation of a fluorescent molecule by, absorb, by the absorption of two photons at the same time. And then when the molecule comes back to the, to the ground state, it will release its energy in the form of a fluorescent photon. The nice thing about this technique is that the fluorescent signal is only generated at the focus of your excitation laser. So in order to form an image of the brain, what you only need to do is just to scan this focus around inside the brain and connect the fluorescent signal at each position. And then when you plot out this, uh, this two-dimensional raster plot, that basically gives you a micrograph of the fluorescent molecule distribution. As this example shows, you can see that the spatial resolution of this technique is clearly sufficient since you, you are able to see individual dendritic spines in vivo. But there's a problem when you try to image uh, the, uh, uh, going beyond a two-dimensional image. And this is important because uh, from a single neuron to a neural circuit, this is really a three-dimensional structure. If you only scan in a 2D plan, you will only be able to have a cross-sectional view of, of the sample. So in order to get a volumetric imaging of the neuron, you basically need to scan you basically need to scan this focus uh, in three dimension. So you can see that it takes time. And secondly, sometimes your, your sample may be moving, and then you will have this motion-induced artifact in your image. And finally, 
If you want to really have high volumetric imaging speed, the traditional approach is basically trying to move this laser focus very rapidly in three dimension. So assume that you can do that. What will, you, what will then happen is that now you will have a huge amount of data because you go from a two dimensional image now to a three dimensional image stack. And because of this motion problem that you want to correct, now you need to do three-dimensional motion registration, which is very difficult to do when you are dealing with gigabytes of data. And typically, uh, traditional neurobiology laboratory are not really equipped, either in terms of computational hardware and expertise to really handle this type of big data. And finally, the actual volume rate is still limited by the brightness of the fluorescent molecule. Even if you can move the laser focus very rapidly, the focus is still required to stay at each individual position for long enough time for you to gather enough photon to see the structure. So when we was, was confronted with this problem, we asked ourselves this question, is this traditional approach of scanning this focus in 3D absolutely necessary? And uh, to, before I give you the answer, I want to show you that those are the neurons in the brain, and you can see individual circles. Those are individual, the cell body of individual neurons. And those are the dendritic spines uh, um, uh, um, in, of a single neuron. So there's a lot of things happening. You see flashes of, uh, of fluorescence intensity change, which is basically telling you that these neurons are becoming active. But despite of all those activities, you would probably also notice is that nothing is changing. The, I mean, sorry, the, the, the neurons are not moving around. I mean, lots of things are changing, but, but the neurons stay put, maybe because of the actual cellular metrics that are holding them in space. But they are, not, they are so stationary that they, are even constant, they even have constant position on the level of a single synapse. So this means now we actually have a choice, which is specifically true if you have a sparsely labeled sample. You could, you could do this conventional scan, and then for a sparsely labeled sample, you will spend lots of time looking at nothing. Or what you could do is to stretch out your excitation focus so that by scanning this focus once in two dimension, you will have a projected view of the, the same volume. But the advantage here is that the imaging frame rate in this particular case is 30 frames per second now become your volume rate. So here you are looking at a volume uh, of brand inside the awake behaving mouse. And you can see the, the, the neurons um, um, become brighter and dimmer, reflecting the activity of this particular neuron. So this type of focus, where we stretch it in the axial direction, is called a basal focus or basal beam. And this conventional type of focus, where it's very small in the axial direction, are called Gaussian beam. Now, basal beam is actually not something very exotic. Whenever you go to supermarket and you go to the checkout line, they will have this red light that is reading the barcode. Those red lights are actually basal beam. But so when we use this for two photon um, fluorescence microscopy, though, we can't just use whatever is inside a, a checkout line uh, of a supermarket. So what we did is that we built a very simple module that is located between an um, excitation laser and a two-photon microscope. I'm not going to go through the detail, but we use this uh, um, little equipment called a special line modulator, which allows us to generate a basal beam of different lengths as well as the narrowness. So here are just two examples. On the right-hand side is uh, what the excitation focus actually looks like in the axial direction. I just want to point out that the actual size, you have to stretch this whole thing by five times um, because uh, it's just too long to show it uh, if I show you uh, with uh, its, its real uh, aspect ratio. So you can see that when we use a longer basal beam, in this case about 60 micron in the axial direction, you can see more structures. But one thing I want to point out is that if you compare the image you get with what you have got gotten with a conventional approach, you can notice that we maintain the ability to resolve individual synapses. For example, there's about three uh, axonal buttons in this Gaussian image, which is clearly detected in the basal images as well. So one big advantage of this approach is that uh, now the imaging become insensitive to the axial motion. So what do I mean by that? So here are the image of a stretch of dendrite in a mouse. 
taken with the Gaussian beam as well as the basal beam. So you can see there's quite a bit of motion because this animal is awake and hasn't been fully habituated to head fixation. And we can easily register this image in 2D just to correct the lateral shift. And then now you can see it doesn't, doesn't jitter in the xy direction as much. And if you now plot out the, in, the fluorescence intensity within this small stretch of dendrite, you can see that in the Gaussian data, you see this up and down signal, which actually looks very much like the, the calcium activity that you would expect to see um, when the neuron become active. However, when you look at the basal data, you don't see such up and those, those, uh, those transient like uh, variations. Now, we could also quantify how much the brain is moving. And when we do that, you actually realize that all those transients we see here are very strongly correlated with the motion of the brain. So then you can say, well, how do you know this is not activity? It could still be some kind of motion-induced activity of the neuron. But we know in this case it cannot be activity because we are not expressing calcium indicator in the brain. This, in this case, it's just a very simple yellow fluorescence protein. So by uh, using a basal beam, now we really don't need to worry about whether the, the, the data you get is contaminated by motion artifact or not. So as I mentioned before, we have synaptic activity, and this really helps us to, to do a, a, sub, a subtype of neurobiological experiment where we ask the question of what are the synaptic input a single neuron receive. So here you're looking at a 3D uh, imaging stack of uh, uh, dendrites of a neuron. You can see there are dendritic spines distributed at a different depth. And the question here we are asking is that what are the orientations and activity each synaptic, each, each dendritic spines, uh, the, of, what are the orientations and activity of the inputs each uh, synaptic spines are receiving? Now, if you want to interrogate uh, all the spines within this volume using the conventional approach, the experiment is going to take about 10 hours. But with basal beam, we could probe the orientations and activity of, the, of, of those synaptic inputs uh, in the same, uh, in a single session, which only will take 20 minutes. So we have about uh, um, uh, 30 times uh, in increase of the throughput. And if you analyze this data, you can then get the tuning property of all the dendritic spines in one run. And in this particular case, we observe some clustering of inputs of similar type. Now, we are not limited to, to this uh, uh, dendritic type of imaging. Any kind of sparsely labeled sample will be, can be studied using this method. So here we are looking at inhibitory neuron population in the mouse brain. And using the conventional approach to probe the first 400 micron of inhibitory neurons, we need to take at least 80 images. But with the basal approach, we only need to take four images. And by doing that, in each imaging session, we can get lots of neurons. And by looking at this data, we very easily visualize uh, this trend that is the subpopulation of neurons have very highly synchronized activity. So if you are into interneurons, then you will ask the question that there are many subtypes of interneurons. We can label a particular subtype called the VIP neuron. And you can again see that with the basal approach, we can get uh, all those VIP neurons in one imaging session. And when we look at their activity, we actually found that those neurons are highly synchronized. And we further discovered that the activity is very much correlated with the diameter of the pupil of the mouse. So now what, what does that mean? It is known that uh, if your pupils are dilated, that means you are paying attention. So I hope all you guys' pupils are dilated at this moment. Um, but what we basically discovered is that a VIP neuron as a population has extremely synchronized activity reflecting the arousal level. Now, if you are in the neuron field, the next cell type you will want to look at are the so-called somatostanding neuron. The reason is because the current model, the most dominant model, is that the VIP neuron will inhibit somatostanding neuron. If this model is correct, then what you will expect is the somatostanding neuron's activity to be always anti-correlated with the pupil. But that's not what we see. We do see anti-correlated population, but we also see lots of population that are also correlated. So this means that uh, this, is, this is really a probably too simplistic picture, and the somatostanding neuron really has heterogeneous activity that wasn't appreciated before.
Now, we actually didn't set out to make this discovery, but because we can image at high throughput, this, this kind of conclusion just naturally may fall out of data with a minimum amount of data analysis. One thing I think will make this technique very powerful is that it is very easy to add this capacity to an existing microscope. So my postdoc, Ron Wen, flew down to Max Planck Florida Institute, and it took him only one day to install a basal beam scanning module on a commercial microscope in the David Fitzpatrick lab. And because biology are much harder, they then spent a, a lot longer trying to get the, the, this high throughput synaptic imaging to work in ferret. So since we published the result, we've been helping multiple labs to implement this method. While we were doing that, we realized there's two limitations of the implementation that we designed originally. Number one is, uh, is the limitation of money, because the specialized modulator is rather expensive equipment. It's about $25,000. Not every lab can easily come up with the money to, to afford it. Secondly is space. Especially for labs that are using commercial microscope, oftentimes it's a very compact design, so it's difficult to fit in an SRM-based module into those space. Into those space. So an alternative is to use the, use the, use the optics that uh, the checkout line also uses, it's called Exicon, to generate a basal beam. It's uh, much cheaper. The whole module now is only about $5,000, and it's very much more uh, compact. But the problem with Exicon-based method is that you cannot really tune how long your, your, your basal beam will be. But my postdoc, Ron Wen, figured out that uh, you can simply transmit a, a length inside the module. And by doing that, we can generate a basal beam of different lengths very easily. So again, here, you need to stretch out the focus about 10 times to appreciate the real length. So because this system is so compact, we can now easily implement it on any kind of microscope. One particular uh, microscope that is of interest here is a mesoscope that was designed and built by the group of uh, Carlos Boda at Ginelia Farm. So this microscope has very large field of view. It's about five millimeter, which covers about 50% of, uh, of, of, of half hemisphere of cortex. And I also want to mention that there's this remote focusing unit there, which allows them to very rapidly move the focus in the Z direction. So we can combine the basal module with the mesoscope. This is how what the whole module looks like relative to the microscope. And now we can probe a very large volume of neurons at very high resolution. For example, here we'll keep zooming in into this very large field of view. And you can still see we maintain the resolution to, um, to see dendritic spines. And just a few nice movies. Um, by uh, combining this with functional imaging, now we can do extra large volumetric functional imaging at high speed. So this is a 300 Gaussian image frame of a single neuron labeled in the mouse cortex. And we can just translate uh, the basal beam six times. We can cover the same volume. And in this case, we can now monitor their activity while maintaining the ability to see individual synapses. And remember, at the beginning of my talk, I mentioned the goal of being able to study the input-output relationship of a single neuron. Now we really have the technique to do that in a wake behaving animal. The very last, last example I want to show is when we look at not just single neurons, but also um, cell bodies in a circuit. So here we are looking at an extra large volume. It's, those are the inhibitory neurons from the first 650 micron. Um, uh, stick in the mouse brain. And we can image this whole volume, 1.3 millimeter by 3 millimeter by 600 micron volume of uh, inhibitory neuron activity at one hertz. And we're still doing data analysis, but just you know, subset of data give us about 1,700 neuron of the, uh, of the activity information. So I just want to quickly summarize. This work was made by the postdoc Ron Wen with help from uh, many biologists um, and collaborators both inside and outside Geneva. Thank you very much.